All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are su super excited to get together with you. We hope you didn't have too much trouble getting the link. We hear there was a little bit of technology challenges. After all these years with the pandemic, Zoom is still causing us fun. So thank you. My name is Kristen LeBlanc. I'm with ATAP, the Association of Talent Acquisition Professionals. We are the association dedicated to representing all uh, folks that work in TA. And we are super excited to be joined today by Armstrong Craven. Uh, they are sponsoring this webinar and this information. So I will start with uh, uh, in introducing David, and then we'll go from there. David Helfrich is the client partner, head of the Americas at Armstrong Craven. Having partnered with, a, and I'm going to read his bio word for word, having partnered with a global, global diversified client base comprised of law firms, startups, multinational corporations, universities, and nonprofits, David utilizes a consultative approach to talent management, executive search, and organizational design, advising clients on best practices to attract, retain, and develop the next generation of leaders. As a client partner, David utilizes experience in organizational development, talent management, DEI, legal and business ops, government relations with brand management to deliver agile professional services in both regional and global clients, to both regional and global clients, excuse me. David also sits on the board of a nonprofit organization engaged in whole health, scholarship, and community engagement. Additionally, David is a published writer and serves as an advisor to national and local political campaigns. David holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from James Madison University and a Juris Doctor degree from Howard University School of Law. So thank you, David, for, for joining us and for sponsoring us today. So well, it's I'll, great I'll, to be here. I'll start thank with you. Leah first. Uh, Leah Molitsetti, excuse me, is a lawyer, published author, speaker, and legal tech innovation specialist. She is currently the head of business development at Legal Interact. Lee is a guest lecturer at the University of Cape Town, a Mandela Washington Fellow, and one of ILTA's, which is the International Legal Tech Association's most influential women in legal tech. So welcome, Leah. Thank you for having me. And last but certainly not least is Colin Levy, Levy, excuse me, is the director of legal at Malbec and is an accomplished legal tech writer and speaker. He was key speaker at Tech Expo 2019, a conference sponsored by the Ontario Bar Association, and has been featured in Above the Law. He also writes frequently on his blog, which was named by Feedspot as one of the top 30 legal blogs in 2020. So welcome, Colin. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. All right. So I'll turn it over to David. He's going to kick us off and get us started with this awesome webinar. For sure. Uh, first of all, Colin and Leah, thank you so much for being here. Super excited for this discussion. And everyone who's joining around the world, welcome on behalf of everyone at Armstrong Craven. We want to wish you a warm welcome and thank you for joining what we believe will be a fascinating discussion. Um, so first question for both of you is just simply to start off by asking you about your, your own personal journey and your own personal story as it pertains to technology. Obviously being in the legal space, you know, which is essentially a traditionalist space where conventional thinking still dominates, uh, very curious as to how, uh, you know, your, your personal journey in legal technology, how you came to um, have affinity for technology and how you implemented it into your careers. So Leah, you can go first, please. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I fell upon legal tech. <laughs> so uh, law was too predictable, if I can put it that way. Um, and then I left corporate and I started a legal consulting company. It just so happened that by then my six month old, um, my youngest baby, I couldn't go consult, you know, with the client. And this was back in 2016. So I then asked the client, hey, how about we Skype? And she agreed. <laughs> so that's when I'm like, oh, cool. So I can actually do what I love and still be a mom, which sometimes can be you know, a conflicting thing, particularly in the traditional legal space. Uh, in any event, um, I was hooked. I googled and then I literally just went into a deep dive of legal tech, figured out things, um, reshifted um, the legal tech startup and I'm now where I am. But I think for me, what really sticks out for me is how technology actually amplifies you. And not only, you know, in the legal tech space, talking about simple things like social media. I always say, you know, it's just a way to actually amplify your trust, you know? And, and for me, legal technology, what it has done is actually reshape my thinking in terms of how I view the law 
and I've made it my life's mission um, in order to literally share the gospel <laughs> of legal tech. And that's why I do a bunch of other stuff beyond my work here um, at Legal Interact, which is a legal tech company based off in South Africa. We like build crazy amounts of uh, different legal tech solutions. I also teach, I also write, you know, so it's, it's one of those things. It's like a bug, you know, once you have it, you just, you need to tell everyone about it, you know? Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Colin, before you answer, it's interesting that you say, you know, you, sh you share the gospel because I know Colin considers himself an e evangelist in this space, right, Colin? So it's funny, uh, the passion you both have towards it is really interesting. Um, Colin, I would love to ask the same question to you to share your journey in the legal tech space. Well, ab absolutely. You know, it's an honor for me to be sharing this uh, this panel with Leia, who has continued to inspire me uh, to do what I do. Uh, I I sort of I think fell upon legal tech as well. Um, you know, I was first sort of exposed to the legal and law and tech relationship. I think when I was a paralegal uh, working in New York for a big law firm prior to law school, creating electronic discovery databases, and I sort of you know, saw kind of how technology could be used to help the delivery of legal services. But I also saw how most of the lawyers really, you know, couldn't care any less about what I was doing. They just cared about, all right, is it done yet? Can I go in? Can I look at what's in there? You know, that sort of thing. And so that, I think, has sort of symbolized a lot of the, the long-standing relationship between tech and law, the sort of tension that exists. Uh, so fast forward to law school, there was very little talk about tech and, and law. Um, and I thought that was a little weird only because tech at the time was continuing to grow massively and its influence and impact upon uh, just so much of how society operates. So following graduation, you know, as I started working, I thought to myself, you know, I can't be the only one who thinks that technology has a role to play in the delivery of legal services. So what I did was I just started reaching out to people who were trying to do things differently, either creating legal tech products, teaching about it, or some combination thereof. And those conversations led me to learning more about it. And as I started to learn more, I shared some of what I was learning with others. And things kind of just took off from there in terms of uh, me sharing, you know, the, the lessons that I was learning, um, trying to educate people about how Legal tech is more than just tech. It's about people. It's about culture. It's about processes. And so that continues to, I think, you know, underlie a lot of what I do in terms of my speaking and writing activity, as well as my work um, here with Malbec as their uh, one and only lawyer. Uh, and my work here pretty much feeds into all the work that I do outside of uh, Malbec. And, and, and I just can't help but continue to talk about it and talk about it in ways that I think makes it more human and more kind of less techy and more of just a, something to be aware of that can be another set of tools in your toolbox. For sure, for sure. And you know, speaking of that, I think it's always worthwhile to talk about some of the practical applications of technology in various industries. You know, in, in human resources and recruitment, for example, we, we often talk about how AI and machine learning is deployed to assist in the sourcing efforts to recruit candidates. Um, and you can how it can actually streamline a lot of those processes as a supplement. When it comes to legal technology, I'm curious. I mean, I, we, we hear a lot about document review, but I'm curious if some other use cases you both find where legal technology is, is most practical and pragmatic um, in the legal space specifically in terms of what kind of functions you find that it's best equipped to supplement lawyering. And uh, Colin, you can go first and then Leia, please, after. Sure. Uh, well, there's just so many different use cases, I think, that are, that are practical. I mean, in my, from my perspective, you know, certainly the first one that comes to mind is management of contracts. Uh, that is what uh, the solution that Mulbeck creates, uh, and it basically helps uh, companies manage their contracts from start to finish. In other words, manage not just the creation of the, doc, of the contract document, but also the negotiation of it, the redlining of it, the implementation of it, and then most importantly, perhaps in some cases, the tracking of different metrics along the way in terms of revenue, in terms of uh, growth over time of the contract's value and, and so on and so forth. So that's one use case. Another certainly is 
with legal research. There are tools now that can help you kind of summarize and find statutes, cases, case law, and provide automated, automated uh, summaries of the cases that have existed. There is also uh, litigation analytics that can provide sort of data with respect to the likelihood of a particular argument, a particular litigation being successful in court. And that can help provide lawyers um, with data to provide more strategic sort of data-driven advice to their clients with respect to a potential uh, litigation matter that they are considering taking. So those are just some use cases. And I'm sure, Alea, you have plenty of others to, to list as well, because like I said, there are so many that are out there. There really are. And I think one thing we should never forget, probably the biggest fear from lawyers that I hear is, oh, it's about to replace me. No, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> It's actually there to help you. Um, and so for us, for example, um, here at Legal & Tractor, we built a bunch of different stuff. Um, one of them being a matter management solution. We call it matter manager. So part of it handles the, you know, the pre-signature stage. So during the contract creation phase, um, you know, even when, you know, you receive the contract, let's say it's in-house counsel and you really want to di dissect the information in such a way that people actually understand it. It can extract key information, actually summarize those contracts, hundreds of pages, you know, into digestible, um, you know, pages. And, and that for me is important because I often feel that um, lawyers forget that the law is not really for us. Uh, it's meant for people who are actually going to use it. Um, and one of the other use cases is in our practice manager solution. So that's really geared for more for, you know, the traditional folks that are practicing law, there's actually um, AI that extracts um, information in terms of invoice, you know, extraction. So that really helps from that perspective, because you know, as we know, billing is important for lawyers, and in terms of how they track and do that. And then obviously, you know, in the contract space, which I think is probably the most popular in terms of the use of artificial intelligence, um, you know, in legal tech. Um, so we have contract manager. So that basically handles all the post signature stuff. So that's where all the procurement guys, you know, they need to keep track or, okay, uh, have reminders or when, you know, do I need to comply with this or, hey, this needs to be renewed, you know, so practical applications that really a lawyer shouldn't be bothered by. Um, so, yeah, those are some. Awesome. Appreciate it. Very interesting. Now, you know, Different cultures and countries obviously have different relationships to technology. There are different stages of advancement in terms of the deployment and application. Um, Leah, this one's for you. I'm curious because I know you were in Nairobi recently discussing technology and its uses in, in legal tech and even beyond that. But from, from your perspective, how do you see the use of technology developing in, in South Africa and the African continent at large? I think we're very excited today. Um, and, and, and probably the, the, the most discouraging thing is the people, most of the people who have the money to spend on tech often go outside, whereas there's actually homegrown technological solutions. That's the thing that keeps me off the most, <laughs> but um, we actually do have incredible solutions. I mean, there's us, um, and then we have real world applications, people like uh, Luma Law. I mean, they're using AI um, as part of a chat bot on Facebook to help people who need assistance, you know, with legal services. So things like that, there are real world applications and there are certain instances of adoption, but in terms of, you know, the funding, in terms of the money, um, I think the thing that really, really pumps me off is that it's going external. Whereas there's a lot of talent and great tech here on the continent. Very interesting. And, and you know, I, I was looking at a recent study that actually showed there's also varying levels of trust in different cultures and countries associate with technology and AI in general. For example, in the American hemisphere, um, user technology users in South America have a lot more trust that they um, that they view and perceive technology than those in North America, which I found interesting. Um, but question for both of you: Do you do you find in your immediate communities and professional communities and just social communities in general that people are trusting of technology and AI or do you find that distrust still persists? And do you, do you think that distrust is warranted or is it based on misperceptions? Um, I'm happy to take that kind of big question on, on first here. I think 
uh, that context is important and the context of tech and trust. I think in, uh, in, in certain cases, there is, I think, a trust for tech to kind of do data analysis well and provide some results. But I also think there is a acknowledgement that you have to be careful in terms of the data that you provide to you know, machine learning algorithms uh, when you are trying to find, um, trying to drive analytics, because you know, data is the lifeblood of a lot of these different algorithms that underlie much of what legal tech does. And so the conclusions and analytics that are provided by the algorithms are only as good as the data. So if you provide a limited data set, you're only going to get a limited analytical result. Uh, and sometimes I think humans not sometimes, I think always, humans have built-in biases that can influence them uh, even subconsciously with respect to the data that they provide to some of these algorithms. And that can play a role in terms of being able to trust the results that you get from using some of these tools. That being said, I don't think that's always the case. I think sometimes there are cases where there may be more trust in the, in the tech and that may come from uh, folks who perhaps have used tech before and understand its strengths and limitations or those who kind of have created tech in the past and therefore kind of have a little more understanding of tech and its capabilities. So I think partly the question around trust and trust of tech depends on your background. You know, if you've never used tech or tech you find intimidating and fear inducing, yeah, there's probably going to be a bit of a trust gap there that will have to be overcome. That'll be less of an issue, I think, if you're coming from a background where you have more experience with tech. And that's something I think that probably is worth acknowledging and being more aware of when it comes to um, talking about tech and trying to increase adoption of tech as well. Uh, not to mention the fact that I think also trust can be the result of different cultures as well. You know, North America has probably a different, you know, uh, cultural endorsement of trust of tech than other countries and other jurisdictions. So that's something also to be aware of. I think it's kind of a complex question that's hard to sort of, you know, generalize about, but I think those are some things to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, I was about to say, but the varying factors that, for example, it also depends on the market that you're targeting. So if you're a business and you're targeting, let's say, another business, I mean, their view and in terms of how they incorporate tech will be quite different from the average person. I mean, case in point in the legal tech space, um, when you look at in-house legal teams versus traditional law firms, you know, in terms of their approach to tech and the understanding of the benefits of it is quite different. Um, when you look also in terms of the industry itself, law is built on trust. It's built on, you know, this whole concept of, I need to be able to trust you. I need to be able to confide in you. So there's a lot of education that needs to happen. And that as well is also very intentional. So in as much as you are trying to push a product or push a service, part of it has to do with educating your market, you know, making them understand the process, making them understand the issues around it, the security around it, or whatever it is around not only the use of the tech itself, but also how it can benefit them, but also assuring them, you know, I mean, when you look at it, even my six, six year old is well versed on my iPhone than I was, you know, I got my first phone when I was in, in what you, you guys call it, uh, what matric, we call it matric grade 12, <laughs> you know? So my, my interaction with tech, I love it now because, you know, I'm comfortable, I've learned about it, but someone who doesn't have that type of knowledge will, will find it quite difficult to actually, you know, engage with it on such a level that the law practice actually requires. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. The last thing I'll just add there is I think there also is a, a generational gap, I think, to keep in mind here that, uh, you know, folks who didn't grow up with tech, but grew with tech as it evolved, I think perhaps have a different approach, a different uh, view of tech than those who kind of just grew up with it and just know that it's existed and it's always existed and just take it for granted. So that is something as well, I think, to keep in mind um, with respect to trust. So we have a couple questions. David, do you want me to go ahead and jump in? Yeah, go ahead. I just saw the questions. It's great. So yeah, okay. it's just a great time to bring in those questions. So please do. Great, so we have one for each of you. So Leah, we'll go for you. What is your take on the recent Gartner's legal tech prediction report on litigation prediction analytics escalating faster than CLM? I mean, on a global perspective, that would make sense. But when you look at it from a South African perspective, um, 
even though the funding is going in the CLM um, side, um, for us, we're still very focused on the traditional um, in terms of role, the traditional roles that tech can actually support. So from a document perspective side, from the CLM side, um, so that would make sense. Uh, but for us, in terms of our context, um, the report makes sense from an external perspective. Um, but my view is quite different in terms of the acceleration thereof. Okay, thank you. Uh, Colin, does the biases which are inherent in the large data set not allow the enhancement of the jurisprudence to make sure law is applied fairly and not biasically? Not sure that's lawyers can thus challenge the status quo. That's an interesting question. I think that. Uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think that certainly it's important to be aware of um, your inherent biases and become aware of how those can influence the data that you feed into um, a particular algorithm or what have you. Uh, and therefore, certainly, you know, when you look at a result and, it, and uh, you need to be aware of that that result may not be entirely accurate because there may be inherent bias in the data set. And so, that's something I think to be increasingly aware of and be cognizant of, because if you're making kind of pretty substantial, substantial decisions based off, you know, analytics using data, you want to make sure that that decision is actually the right one, not based off of, you know, biased data. And with respect to evolving jurisprudence and all that, absolutely, I think that's something to be aware of as well, and that kind of how cases have been decided Certainly, I think have evolved due to inherent biases of those deciding the cases for sure. And so that also can play a role with respect to um, analytics that you derive from jurisprudence. So, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. And I think it's, it's we're only at the cusp of kind of fully understanding how to account for those things and, and understand them. But as tech evolves and becomes more complex, particularly on the litigation analytics side, it's become increasingly important to pay attention to these things and be aware that they may exist even if you've done all you can to ensure that that's not the case because our subconscious does a lot of things in the background we may not even be fully aware of and others may not even be aware of either because they have those same inherent biases. And I think, you know, um, one of the consequences that I wrote about um, in my book about legal tech was around actually the increase in algorithm auditing. And for me, that is important. You need to be able to check yourself. Um, in as much as you know, tech is there, the AI is there, the analytics and the data. Um, unfortunately, humans are not perfect. <laughs> so we need to be able to have a way to actually double check, uh, you know, what we're doing. So the auditing at some point will become quite critical. Absolutely, I, I totally agree with you on that. I think it's super important. I think that. Um, you know, it's important to, I think, just be aware of the fact that uh, technology is created by humans and humans are inherently imperfect. That's just a hallmark of us being human. And accordingly, tech itself is not going to be perfect either because it's created by humans. So we have to kind of understand those imperfections and account for them as we use these tech tools, because we may do our absolute best to ensure that it works as intended but the likelihood is it may not always work as intended because of those inherent imperfections in ourselves. For sure, you know, and, and kind of building off of that, that, legal tech kind of reminds me in some ways of the discussion around intellectual property many decades ago when it was first coming to the forefront, being that particularly in the United States, the constitution is silent on that because obviously these are areas that have developed long since the constitution was written. Now in South Africa, the constitution is relatively new in the, in the 90s. So it may actually have been able to anticipate some of these problems, but just to kind of draw com comparisons to HR recruitment and also the legal space, you know, there, there have been some pushback on technology, right? For example, there's been studies that have shown AI and tech utilization and recruitment has actually led to what they call high tech discrimination, such that in 2023 employers in New York will be banned from using automated employment decision tools to screen job candidates. And now I know the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, is now, uh, has now signaled that they're gonna delve into AI tools to understand how they may contribute to bias. And I think it's important to note that 
you know, this technology still is being built by humans. So it can reflect either the benevolence of the human or the, the bias in the human, right? So I think, um, and when it comes to the law, I'm curious though, what areas do you perceive could be ripe for regulation? Uh, for example, like what if we get to a point where AI is being deployed to determine whether or not charges should be brought in a criminal investigation, right? What if that supplants the human inquiry into investigation? Uh, do you see areas where you think AI and, and technology is gonna need to be more regulated moving forward? On my side, um, <laughs> I'll probably have an opinion in terms of the regulatory side of AI, particularly in the legal tech space, but not in the strictest sense of the law because that's no longer my area of expertise. So for example, what's happening now in the country is uh, we're reshifting in terms of tech itself. Um, even the court system of weighing court online. So that's going to require a different type of lawyer. So, and unfortunately our regulatory body um, does not have a specialist area that has to do with tech. And that for me is quite critical because when you look at other areas, so for example, in Nigeria, they have a technology uh, department within the Nigerian bar. And that for me is interesting because it tells me, oh, okay, they've actually kept that in mind in terms of the consequences. Uh, and so as we evolve and as we try to innovate and as AI continues, it cannot happen in isolation. You know, so there are a lot of players that need to come to the party, particularly well for me, um, you know, in South Africa, our regulatory bodies in terms of how we can actually regulate better. Um, but then, I mean, we have laws that have come to the fore, so for example, uh, cybersecurity laws. So things that are trying to assist in terms of what's happening, you know, on the internet and so forth, but we still have a long way to go, basically. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're absolutely right on that. I, you know, my concern with with regulation is, uh, I think there is definitely a need for there to be sort of some regulatory and ethical frameworks around the use of tech uh, and how it's used and by whom. The problem, though, I think, as Leah kind of alluded to in some ways, is that often the expertise is not there for there to be effective regulation. The the regulators. Um, and we've seen this time and time again, at least in the U.S. with Congress, not to, you know, I don't want to bring politics into this, but I think that um, to the extent to which there is expertise or is not expertise, that's reflected in the regulations of various industries and, and tech is no different. And I think, you know, tech is very complex and it's very nuanced and it's very important to have that understanding of the complexity and the nuance when you're trying to develop a regulation around use of a particular tech tool or a set of tech tools. And so, you know, to the extent to which there isn't that level of knowledge, um, you run the risk of kind of taking a sledgehammer or something that may be better um, suited for use with a scalpel. In other words, you want to be, I think, careful in terms of how you regulate so that you create an effective workable framework without making it so cumbersome and so restrictive, yeah. right, overly restrictive. Um, so, you know, it can really could go either way. Um, and I think we've seen time and time again that things, at least in the U.S., tend to go one way or the other to one extreme or another. And, and that is very, I think, unfortunate and difficult. Um, and I think does society a disservice because you often want to have uh, a regulatory framework that is flexible, dynamic, and attuned to that which you are regulating and so, you, you know, you can't really regulate all of tech. You have to really focus on, on specific areas. The only way to know how to focus is to understand exactly what it is you are trying to focus in on. And that will require expertise. And so I do think there are a lot of folks that need to come to the party to be a part of that process. And I fear that they may not necessarily happen right away. And, you know, David, you know, you mentioned that uh, I was in Nairobi um, a while back. You know, part of that entire you know, um, summit was literally around um, African AI policy development, having a dialogue around that, because there's so many key uh, different stakeholders. It's not just only lawyers that are impacted. You know, they're business, they're business people. There's the state that needs to be involved. So it's really a collective effort in order to actually create these particular frameworks in order to enable, 
you know, people to actually use tech also safely. You know, there's a whole big issue right now around privacy, you know, all of those aspects that we need to consider uh, through the use of tech and AI. Yeah, ab absolutely. The last thing I'll just add there is I think, you know, I think that different jurisdictions can learn from other ones. And so I think there is definitely a need for more collaboration and transparency around how different jurisdictions are approaching regulation of tech. You know, how Kenya is doing it versus South Africa is doing it, how the U.S. is doing it from, you know, countries in Europe. You know, there's just, I think there's not enough of that collaboration around these frameworks and everyone is trying to kind of do their own thing. And that can be problematic, particularly when we're living in a very global world that's increasingly interconnected. And so there needs to be, I think, a, a broader framework around use of some of these technologies, because otherwise it's going to be an unworkable framework and you're going to have run into issues with use of tech because one country will allow, another country will say, and eh, not so much. And, you know, how are you supposed to work with them when one country says yes and the other says no? Right, absolutely. Excellent points, all things to consider. So, you know, we've, we've touched upon some of the challenges and also the benefits, but what I'd like to ask you both is where you see technology moving forward, particularly in legal tech, but also in, in society in general in various industries, you know, as AI tools and technology continues to develop and become more sophisticated, what excites you the most about where you see technology interfacing in the legal tech space in terms of making, uh, making lawyering more efficient, but also improving um, the quality of the work product in your, in your space? Personally, for me, you know, there used to be this whole debate around law tech, legal tech, <laughs> and all of that. And for me, it really doesn't make a difference as long as people are building. Um, and what excites me the most is seeing so many people actually building solutions that are fit for people, for people to actually make use of it. This is now in the traditional law talk space, uh, access to justice space, where we're seeing more of that because we need it. Um, we need it for people who look like me, for people who would not traditionally have the bank balance to approach a lawyer. And that for me is important. So seeing those type of solutions coming into the market excites me incredibly. Uh, but obviously, you know, the in-house legal teams, <laughs> I've grown an affinity <laughs> to them. Um, so they also excite me, particularly in the legal spend space. Um, I would love to see more, more of that in terms of how that works, that nuance around it. So yeah, for me, that's what I'd like to see a bit more of, of change and focus. Yeah, and, and, and for me, I, you know, what excites me the most is not necessarily, you know, what you call it or the tech itself either, but more about the cultural change that is re the result of use of tech to develop new business models, new ways of delivering legal services that are cheaper, that are faster, that are more efficient, and that are more transparent. Because as Leah mentioned, and other, you know, to her, and, and also for me, access to justice is incredibly important. You know, the legal system here in the U.S., is very expensive and can be cost prohibitive for too many people. And I see tech really trying to make the legal system more accessible, more transparent to a lot of people. And that really is very much needed because you shouldn't have to jump through hoops to kind of just file basic paperwork to either create a company or you know file for divorce or what have you. you know, these are all just basic things that shouldn't require a huge amount of effort and expense to accomplish. And I think tech can really do wonders in that space in terms of bridging the gap, if you will. I also think that, you know, processes around how legal tech, how legal services are delivered, what qualifies as legal services are also exciting because tech, I think, is redefining kind of what it means to be a lawyer, what it means to be a legal professional. And that, I think, will have long ranging, deep impacts going forward with respect to the legal industry as a whole worldwide. And that I think is very exciting. And, uh, and, and it's gonna be, I think, a really dynamic time going forward as tech continues to make inroads in the legal space. Wonderful. Um, so we just got another question from the audience for, for both of you. This is um, somebody asking, hello to you both. Um, I wanna get started in legal technology. How would you advise me to start in this space, specifically looking as a person trained as an attorney? They, uh, this person asks, are there certain groups, consultants, or people 
you can approach to assist to get your programmers to see if the ideas can actually work. I think basically what this person is asking is how did you get started? Like, how did you both get started in this space? And how would you advise somebody who wants to get started to, well, what should they do? Um, I'll start from a, you know, legal tech <laughs> startup uh, story. Um, I didn't know everyone, you know, uh, Colin and some of you were probably the first few people um, that I discovered on Twitter. Uh, so um, what I would suggest is finding what you want to solve and just fall in love with the problem. Like literally just fall in love with it, understand it, all its angles, understand how people interface with it, understand particularly if it's in the legal tech space, how lawyers approach it and how you can approach it, um, how it can be done differently. Do you? Is it even necessary for it to be done differently? But from a network perspective, because I see the name Look South African. So if you are in South Africa, please um, look into the South African Legal Tech Network. Um, they are on LinkedIn. They're very, very good in terms of linking up people. I know they also provide a lot of mentoring, but Twitter is your best place. <laughs> Twitter is your best place. I learned a lot. Um, I met a lot of people on Twitter. I use the hashtag um, Legal Tech. You'll find them. You'll probably find me. You'll probably find Colin. He's always sharing his thoughts there. But um, it's about being intentional about learning from everyone, but also being aware of the problem that they're trying to solve. Because I think a lot of people get lost in legal tech and think that it's only one. It's actually very broad. Um, I was shocked <laughs> when I actually, you know, really dived into it and understood how big it is. And so you need to decide which area you know you're going to fall. Is it going to be, for lack of a better word, in the law tech side? And I mean, if you're in that space in a South African context, you're looking at organizations such as Hill. Um, they are more in the grant space. Um, if you are more in the, if you want to build solutions that are lawyer facing in the legal tech space, you are then looking at the broader side of the tech space in terms of from a funding perspective, in terms of that. So that's where you look at the incubators from a support system, the incubators, the accelerators. Um, there's a whole bunch of um, organizations that are really working towards the tech space as a whole on the continent. So that would help. But honestly, um, you will actually accelerate your learning if you just are intentional in terms of your network. So follow the right people, learn from them. They probably tag other people and that's how it'll grow. That's how I did it. Um, I, I shared as I learned uh, and I continue to do so every day. Yeah, I mean, I, that's pretty much the same approach I, I took is, uh, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize one point, which is uh, something that Leah pointed out, which is, being outcome driven, you know, you want to really focus your efforts on what, why do you want to learn about legal tech? What is driving? What is the outcome you're trying to achieve or um, learn about achieving? And let that kind of define how you initially learn about legal tech. Because I say that because legal tech is indeed broad, can be overwhelming, it can be confusing. There's a lot of different uh, areas within it, a lot of people that are doing different things in it. And if you kind of just want to, if you kind of just take this, you know, oh, well, I just want to learn about legal tech, you're going to find yourself, I think, really kind of confused, not know where to, where to begin. Um, whereas if you're trying to go after a specific outcome that can help define kind of your initial learning about legal tech, and then as Leah pointed out, that then will branch out and you start realizing that there are other people you want to be connected to and learn about. And we're all very supportive and encouraging of that, I think, within the space. So very I think the more you can kind of start reaching out and branching out after you officially, after you kind of initially start learning about a specific area, I think you'll find it to be very uh, useful and fruitful for you. Um, and quite frankly, people really are eager to share what they're doing. Uh, and I was eager to share what I was learning about as I was learning. And so that would be something I would re I reiterate as well is kind of, you know, learn and share what you're learning and others will, I think, flock to kind of what you have to have to say because everyone's eager to learn. Uh, and the last thing I would just say is, you know, talk less and listen more. Ask questions and just listen to the stories that are being told. And I think you'll find them very informative, inspires, inspiring and encouraging. 
And, you know, people will be more than happy to share with you what their experience has been like. For sure, for sure. Um, so last question for you both is related to training in this space. You know, at Armstrong Craving, we use AI machine learning to source. So we use it in talent intelligence, talent analytics. It's constantly evolving and we're constantly staying on top of it so that we can best serve our clients. I'm sure that's the case for you in your space too. But specifically when it comes to lawyers and legal technology, would you like to see more training? And this can even be something that could uh, manifest in the legal curriculum, right? In the United States, you, you go to law school for three years, maybe your third year, would you like to see some elective courses in legal technology, more practical coursework that might be able to prepare a lawyer who's just graduating law school to be able to actually be more adept at utilizing legal technology in the future? How do you see training for lawyers in this space? And would you like to see um, particularly the legal curriculum in both the United States and South Africa adapt to be a little bit more in line with what's happening and where the future is going. So I, you know, I think for me, I think training is kind of an interesting question because on the one hand, uh, here in the U.S., uh, over 30 states have enacted this duty of tech competence, which is essentially this ethical duty that lawyers have in the U.S. to understand the risks and benefits of relevant technology. That's pretty much what the rule says. Of course, lawyers being lawyers, they don't define exactly what that means. That said, I think there is recognition uh, because of that rise and that rule for there to be some awareness of technology and some understanding and training. Uh, that being said, I think when it comes to learning about tech in law school, at least in the US, I would argue that it's better to learn about basic tech principles and kind of the different types of tools that exist rather than learn about specific tools because the tools likely will change very quickly over time and you don't wanna be outdated with your knowledge. Uh, I also think it's important to acknowledge that at least in, in US law schools, there aren't enough people equipped to teach about tech. Uh, so you can't just kind of tell law schools you should be teaching tech. You should also try to help them encourage them to find people capable of teaching these things because by and large, the teachers teaching in law schools are teaching things that they've been teaching for years and years and that those often are not related to tech. Uh, and so you need to have the right people in place to be able to teach about tech. I agree. You know, I mean, for us, we don't even have a master's um, in legal tech, you know, in the country. There's probably only one. Um, well, I heard, can't confirm, in, in Senegal on the continent you know, from, from an educationary perspective. But in terms of the, what well, we call it the LLB degree, I, I, I don't think um, there's a need for a shift purely because, um, and I think Colin correctly pointed out, tech evolves, tech changes. And, you know, Emma, also remember for us, particularly in South Africa, the people who are effectively using tech are the big firms, you know, and also your medium, medium um, sized firms, so the one man shows, you know, there's still, you know, paper, uh, pen to paper and so forth. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, but on some level, you need to be able to be tech competent in terms of your basic tools. I'm talking, you know, your Microsoft tools and things that you would typically use as a lawyer, which, by the way, I think lawyers aren't actually effectively using as much as they could. Um, you know, before you even go out in terms of building and so forth, master what you already have. That's one. Uh, but then two, just a certain base level of, of tech competence for me, that would make me happy. And also a clear understanding of things like processes, you know, that you don't function in isolation as a lawyer. Now, whether that can be taught as part of the curriculum or because what happens with us after you get your law degree, then you get to law school. So there's an option where in which you can actually either do your training, your articles in one year, or you do it in two years, depending on how long you take at law school. So during that time period, there's certain courses, you know, that you're taught. So some of them actually is inclusive of, of tech courses, but they're very, I don't think they're sufficient in my view. Um, more so because you only get specific tech training when you only open your firm because there's an obligation on you to actually be able to manage in terms of practice management. So that's where you actually get a certain level of tech training in order for you to get your certification and so forth. 
Um, so that's very limiting because obviously that means if someone is not going to open their own law firm, if they're going to be employed, it means they won't get that training. And so that's why, you know, we're being very intentional, you know, instead of just talking about it, that's why I teach. Literally, I think I posted this yesterday uh, where I shared the course that we're doing. That's why, you know, you're being part of the solution that, oh, okay, we don't have it right now. Let's do something about it, you know, let, let's, let's figure out our colleagues. I mean, we know what is in the market because unfortunately theory doesn't always match with practice. So give them the practical, you know, tools that they need, the practical know-how, because it's beyond just the tech itself, it's interpersonal skills, it's understanding concepts like legal design in terms of how you're going to offer legal services, or how you're even going to design your legal tech tools if you're deciding to go into, you know, the startup world, things like that, you know. Excellent. So we have come to the end of our program. This has been really phenomenal. I want to thank you both for joining. But are there any final last words you'd like to express or anything we, we, we didn't touch upon that you feel is important for the audience to be aware of? The only thing I, I would just say is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Leah would agree with me, you know, feel free to reach out to either one of us. We're more than happy to, to talk with you, to help you, to support you, to kind of uh, give you some tips with regards to finding your way in this exciting space. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We're both uh, pretty active on both LinkedIn and, and Twitter. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't hesitate to reach out if you have further questions following this, this discussion. Yeah, perfectly agree. Also because I think I must say, uh, as opposed to the traditional legal space, legal tech is very welcoming, <laughs> very welcoming. People always willing to help. Um, and you actually end up paying it forward. Literally today I was sitting down um, with a lady in Zimbabwe, she's going to launch um, her startup. She's excited, she just needed some guidance. And there I am putting my two cents in. You know, so we're very open to sharing because I think we probably all share the same pain because we understand what it's like to go against the grain um, of the traditional space. So it helps, you know, there's a sense of global camaraderie, um, you know, within us. Uh, so yeah. Good to see Colin here. <laughs> Good to see you here too, Leah. <laughs> For sure, you know, I just, just, you know, discussing with you both and speaking to other people in this space, I can co-sign everything you said. The level of enthusiasm and collaboration in the legal tech space is really something to behold. And I think that speaks well for where it's going in the future and, and just also the network that's being grown there. So once again, thank you to, uh, to you both for joining us. Um, it was enlightening and I found it to be a lot of fun and I hope the audience did as well. We will have this available on demand and we'll share that link as soon as we conclude here. But on behalf of everyone at Armstrong Craven, thank you for joining us. Uh, Leah and Colin, it's been wonderful. Special thank you to Kristen and ATAP for helping us facilitate. And yeah, reach out to us for, for more exciting programs to come. Uh, but thank you again and everyone have a wonderful day and a wonderful afternoon uh, wherever you are at. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.